Could you introduce uh, yourself and uh, explain what you're doing at LinkedIn? This is, okay. Hey, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Nick. Um, I work for Casco, and uh, we help insurance companies and MGAs to push digital products to market uh, within six weeks um, by having built our own MGA operating system. Yeah, I'm Robin. I'm a recovering Allianz sales agent, and I've been clean for six years. <laughs> you may clap now. Um, what I've been doing, so I started ranting on stage that old white men in insurance sea suits actually have lost contact to reality. And instead of being booed off stage, I got a lot of calls. And uh, after understanding uh, that um, uh, we build a company called Digital Scouting, which started as a blog, as mentioned, and now we help insurers with digital products and services, with uh, market entry strategies, and also with attention hacking. That's what we do. But I still rant on stage, so that's, that's, that's my job here, I think. Well, last but not least, uh, probably the biggest one and the slowest one in the room. So representing old traditional mutual, <laughs> we've been there for 200 years. Uh, not totally dinosaur in terms of our capabilities, but uh, when listening to the uh, presentation today and this morning, we do have our share when it comes to uh, embracing change. And nevertheless, I've been to the group for four years now, and everything within digital meaning the transformation part is, is of course something I do, but uh, more of that a bit later. Back to you, Xavier. Yeah. My name is Xavier Gomez, I'm co-founder of the Sorry, sorry. Business intelligence platform uh, powered by machine learning and natural language and processing um, dedicated for financial services. We provide a SaaS platform to uh, banks, insurance companies, consulting firms, and um, VC fund in order uh, to support them in their digital transformation. So, interesting subject. I think AI for you guys are uh, much more optimistic story. No? No. No? Why do you create the startup? Why, how could I create a startup that doesn't say that I do anything with AI or you know use actual <coughs> intelligence versus artificial intelligence? Mm -hmm. I could now make the joke that you're not looking for a fast exit. Maybe that's a difference. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, listen. I think you know. Um, for me, the, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in the uh, potential of AI to you know automate certain repetitive tasks and to garner. Unique insights from you know large and possibly unstructured data sets, great. But I also think, um, from what I'm seeing with um, where the insurance industry is today, I think you know there's a, a, a three-step process. And I didn't I didn't even have to uh, kind of come up with it myself. I just kind of copied it from Peng An, who I thought were pretty pretty good on you know the AI front, and they basically say you know the first thing you need to do is have you know, digital first data collection processes, right? And most insurance companies are not even there yet. So first thing is collect data in a structured manner. Second then is have a rules-based or hypothesis-driven heuristic-based model about rules. You know, people think of certain rules and then you kind of automate, augment. And then you inject AI. So what I think a lot of uh, insurers are doing is, you know, innovation theater, you do a little bit of AI, uh, it looks good, but it doesn't really scale throughout the organization um, because they haven't done step one and two, which is really hard. I think Ping An stated in this interview it was a 10-year journey. So, you know, just setting up innovation app is not gonna, gonna cut it, I think. Um, and also, um, I'm, there was this other article, 50% of all European AI startups don't have AI. Mm -hmm. And then, so yeah, we're a startup and we don't have AI. Okay. You guys, can I <coughs> build a double that because what you just said, Nicholas, was very true when, when I joined the company. Who of you have been part of some sort of a hackathon? Most of us, and, uh, and no surprise. <laughs> but, uh, for us, in relation to the, uh, we need to have the uh, stuff first, meaning the data. Uh, our management kind of forgot that, and instead what we chose, we, we just threw out money in those hackathons, and, and there was this wish 
that this innovation fairy would come with his or her dust and then sprinkle it around. And then all of a sudden we would have some sort of uh, proposition, capability, what have you. It took almost six months for me to cut it off and get him back to basics. And for example, in healthcare, any successful implementation of real, at least some, with some real capabilities in terms of AI, they have slight data like from 10 years in terms of data sets. So that gives some perspective uh, before running into, into details. Obviously, we have some of that data collected uh, far longer than that, but it's not applicable alone. So, so we have our uh, sort of a preparation work to be done before really getting into it. Nevertheless, we are already piloting some ideas. And uh, of course, uh, the promise is, is huge, but uh, we need to do our uh, homework first before getting there. So promises is huge, uh, I think everybody agree on that. But don't you think we, we forgot uh, one element you just mentioned, a talent. In order to, to, to make applicable this kind of technology in old-fashioned industries such as insurance, you need uh, talent, skills, and to create the trust of uh, current employees and colleagues on that. Well, I think you touched a very serious point there. The big question, I think we could agree on where the ship is sailing and what kind of vision in the future lies. We can uh, look to Southeast Asia to see what the future might look like, what they're doing in healthcare there, if you want to go for the healthcare example. But the big question is, uh, which one of your um, a ship um, a crew can you take with you? Which one can you educate? And by the way, you don't need a ship, you need an airplane. Yeah? And um, so that's a big question. But I want to get, um, get a step back um, to touch a point that I think it's not only the talent that's super important, but it is the commitment of the leadership. Um, if you don't have the commitment of the leadership to really do it, and they're happy with a, with a hackathon, they're happy with an innovation lab, um, then you have a problem. Don't get me wrong, Hackathon is great and uh, to, to get touch, in touch with people, may I hire people, it's, it's a great instrument, but it does not help you to transform a company of 5,000 or 10,000 people. And what I want to say before we go into the, oh, we need a data scientist uh, to, to join the team is, first of all, you need to start using data. I mean, we are in, in mid-size insurers or, or larger insurers um, that do not even use the few data they have. They don't even use the data which broker is actually making us money and which broker is actually costing us money, which customer is making us money, which customer is costing us money. What is with our employees? Which one in the call center is doing a great job and which one is uh, idling around? There's in, in a lot of cases no traction of that. And before we go to the direction of saying we need talent and, and, and conquer, conquer the world, let's start doing the stuff we need to do now. But that's super, super hard. It's like going to the gym, you know, my wife told me I need to lose weight uh, this, this year and, and it's, really, it's, it's really easy, you know, you don't have to stop eating crap and going to the gym. It's the same with digital transformation, you know, we can go and do the short crud, a shortcut and go to the hackathon or the, uh, the, 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 the innovation lab. This is but just like ta taking steroids. Nothing, nothing helps you to get in shape, in the digital shape, than to do it. So you need to go to the gym, you need to do it, you need to do the transformation, and you need to um, also yeah, eat healthy. Th th this means also, you know, ask the hard question what you started, do we have the right people at the right, right uh, point or not? And if we look at the leadership, it's so much easier to do a shortcut, to take a shortcut, than actually to do the hard thing than, to go, than going to the gym. But um, uh, that doesn't lead you to where you want to go, I think. Actually, what is uh, your opinion on that? Because you have a lot of companies. Uh, well, uh, I will go take a step back regarding this trust you mentioned and, and defining, for example, capabilities under AI. In fact, we are adding one S, artificial support intelligence. Mm -hmm. And that has been a sort of a, uh, not only stepping stone, but a foundation that, okay, this is the way we are going to implement, use, utilize, and enable any capability in relation to the uh, machine learning. Uh, I wouldn't use the word AI in our context, it's a bit too powerful, but then I guess those features around it uh, implemented in a way that our people can understand those. But uh, yes, I agree, the, uh, the ship is, uh, or the vessel is a bit too slow, we need airplane, and at the same time we are, are painfully aware that uh, not all the people on board today 
are capable of flying in the future. But, uh, but we need to have that trust in place in order to uh, retain and then attract uh, the talent we need in the future. How do you create a good team on that? Because the subject of the panel is uh, customer engagement. At the end, this is customer experience. How to improve your relation with the final customer. How we can create um, a good experience with AI. What does it mean? Do you have older employees with a lot of experience? Sometimes old fashioned, but they have the experience, they know client better than anyone. And you have a youngster, that new data scientist came on the team, and you have to create a kind of diversity. How we can manage that in order to provide the right service with the support of AI? So, so I think, and this has nothing to do with AI, I think, how do you get a powerful team, right? Um, and it's always the three, it's the same three building blocks. You need to have meaningful work, meaningful relationships, and fair compensation. So with meaningful work, this means you need to have a, an interesting challenge that entices, driven, motivated, smart, experienced, whatever people to give it a crack. Right? Uh, you need to have meaningful relationships. You need whatever a diverse team is, the important thing here is that they respect each other. Ideally, they also like each other, but usually in the work environment, it's about respect. And then you need to, and we discussed this, fair compensation. And you know, if you're, um, if you're looking for really hot uh, data scientist talent, you need to um, pay a fair market salary um, and outcompete against the tech, defense, banking, who might pay premium dollar or pay consultancy for you know loaning, uh, lending you this capability. But I think the, the main point, what is a challenge is, if you don't get this first one right and give a meaningful task that is interesting, people will come, they give a crack at it, and they have options. And then they'll just go because there's um, other planes in the air. Um, and I think that's the key. Things of what happens after the chatbot or whatever you uh, do, and I think that's the core thing. It's uh, it's that first part that some just struggle if they don't think about it in strategic, long-term sense. Nothing to do with that either. And Ruben, if I may, a direct comment. That that's how we approach in in building our own team, for example, for uh, chatbots, uh, RPA, what have you. Uh, having identifying that talent we had in the organization, uh, combining that with external knowledge but are really uh, not giving the uh, sort of turnkey authority to the external ones, rather than just training our people. But then again, that's the tricky part, because uh, I painfully see and understand what is the uh, a check level outside our organization today. So we really need to treat people well. We really need to enable them to be the best what they can do, and then of course treat them well enough for them wanting to stay. And that has actually yielded quite remarkable results because uh, by that way, by finding that expertise in your own organization, we can actually go way deeper than any external consultant. And as an example, our robotics team is now uh, teaching and consulting other industries, uh, uh, municipals, uh, tax authority in Finland, and likes, uh, because those consultants are missing very crucial point when it comes to those, uh, their business processes. And that was a bit surprising finding. And of course, now I have, have to do everything in my power to safeguard those people from those consultants, because you won't be losing your edge as soon as you enter the uh, outside the door, but after six months, that edge is gone. So interesting balance between our own and external capabilities in making those whatever AI-related stuff happen in the future. The, 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 one, well, one thing uh, to you that I really find interesting that you now actually make money by the competencies you build up yourself. I mean, that's yet what Ping An plans, plans to. They want to become in a decade 50% of their revenue, and they have quite large revenue. They want to become t uh, b b b um, coming in from consulting and tech businesses. So maybe if insurer really, really uh, do a great job, a lot of uh, monetization opportunities lay ahead. But the question was a high achievement teams and how, how can you do it? I think. Uh, and, and it's not about the old against the new. It's not about, uh, uh, it's not a gender issue, it's not a race issue, it's not an age issue. You have um, sometimes in companies 55 year old super expert that just waited for a new CEO or CIO coming in and liberating him uh, and, or, or her from uh, restraint. So um, I think that we have two groups in companies. You have the 
people that see possibilities and you have people that see just the problems. And to be quite honest, um, when you want to have a high achievement team, that's the baseline to achieve anything, you know, data cleansing, data structuring, AI, building digital products and services, knowledge you can sell. What you need is a high achievement team. And um, to be quite honest, the challenge is to have a look at your um, overall team see where are the yaysayers, where are the people that support that. And then you have constant people that are toxic. You know, if you're a small company or a big company, you need to cut that out as cancer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's hard. It's hard because uh, so maybe, it, maybe it's a young person, a new person you just hired for a gazillion euros because it's a data scientist, but it's, I don't know, you know, it doesn't fit to the team to reverse this decision. It's political damage for yourself. Or it's a person since 25 years, um, you know, this, uh, causing chaos in your organization, and nobody had the balls to to address that problem. Um, so uh, it's super, super hard. But the achievement, if you have a high performance team, it's amazing what you can achieve with only a few people or even a few hundred people. So it's it's unbelievable. So let's let's look at what we can do together there. Interesting. What do you think we can do as today in order to improve customer engagement in insurance? And don't try to engage too much. Uh, I think the best insurance product is an invisible insurance product. I think the whole reason, I remember I was sitting with a large reinsurance company and they said we want to make insurance more engaging. I mean, this is a reinsurance company, so they've never seen an actual customer, so that's okay. <laughs> but it's to say no. I mean, the reason why people go to intermediaries, to trusted intermediaries, it really reduces my complexity. I go to someone a knowledgeable, trusted person, whether I should trust the business model here is a different discussion, but I trust this person, this person takes all this pain away from me, navigates, he or she navigates this landscape, and this is why people use this service. And I think, um, and we've discussed this, so I think an insurance product in and of itself is not should not be that engaging, make it easy. Um, make it passive for the customer, make it fit, but don't expect too much active engagement by the customer. Um, or it's not an insurance product anymore. We're talking different products. That's that's fine. You're venturing into different types of, of services. But a good insurance product is a product I never have to see and hopefully never engage with. Um, but then ideally, at the point of claim, I actually get, uh, get regulated. I think that's what some people forget. That's, that's good insurance UX, no engagement. Or see totally differently. So I, I strongly disagree. Uh, why? Because I believe, yeah, I, I, I disagree. Why? Because uh, if you have not the engagement of the customer, the big danger today with new entrants in the market is you can lose the customer. And what I strongly believe is going to happen there Customer. The end customer. The one that you already gave away to the intermediary or where you buy your paid ads? So which customer are you talking about? I'm, I'm talking about the, the customer that is in your system. So if you do not in, engage uh, significantly with him or her, then you're going to lose it. And if it's a tight agent, it doesn't matter anyway. Um, so um, 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 yeah, I think it's a, the, in, the insurance customer in general um, and who is you know attracted now by different uh, companies. Um, and if you, um, you lose that, then you get cut up slice by slice by the attackers, the ones who selflessly uh, then deal with the customer, like Amazon and things like that. So um, uh, I think that's that's super dangerous. Um, I think even you would need to go to the contrary direction. You need, to, and as insurance and banks, and that's what I really like about Finnovative, that we have you know, both industries here. As insurance and banks, you need to become the trusted partner that accompanies your people in, a da in their daily lives and supports them and solves their problem. May it be uh, um, building wealth, maintaining wealth, managing wealth, increasing wealth, or securing it against the risks of life events. Um, and if we don't do it, somebody will take this position with the customer, and they will not keep us alive for long, I fear. Very interesting. That's directly from our steering and boardroom discussions. That very same topic. We have totally the same use. It's uh, forget it, not interesting. Let's try and automate. Let's try to be that uh, gray wallpaper on the background, and then just take care of anything critical. Let's take care of that. And then the direction we've taken is actually the act, uh, very active engagement, not only in insurance, but in previous panel, preventing stuff from happening, adding health and well-being elements, adding wealth management elements into your offerings, 
and that then requires <coughs> far more active engagement than before. But Nicholas, I like your thinking because, again, honestly, when it comes to insurance, this is my favorite question. How many of you last Sunday woke up and started browsing different insurance options? Anyone? Me neither. So, it kind of tells the story when it comes to insurance. I'm sorry, but with the engagement with that, I just combined. Uh, I think we need to, to create product that engage. Uh, we don't have to look at an insurance product just only what the actuaries and the underwriters have done. It's it's something, it's a full experience that we offer it. Effectively, I don't wake up on, on Sunday to browse uh, what exactly I'm going to get as an insurance policy. Because I buy an insurance policy once a year, or maybe twice. Uh, or maybe I will buy it every 10 years if the engagement and the service is great. Uh, it's not about us being able to offer a product where you're browsing and you're finding exactly what you want every time and so on. It's just about like, how can I be sure that I'm insured very well every time? So if I have an issue with my door not opening at all, I know I can call my insurer. If I have an issue, an issue with my daughter not feeling well, I know I have an insurer which has this platform of doctor and I can talk to them and so on. So um, yeah, we are not a Amazon, we are not a fashion company and so on. But even with innovation, technology and everything coming up, insurance will be one of the most essential protection from everyone in the planet. And we need to understand that customers are changing, there's digitalization and so on. And we need to involve the customer. Customer need the brand that's love them and they love the brand. This is what we have to be thinking of. Maybe one thing, so uh, maybe I agree partially with, with Nick, oh, for example, I'm trying to buy a, a term life insurance for at least the last five months, and I mean, give, providing the customer with an 80-page PDF where you even can't find the damn, you know, quota and the price and the terms, that's not customer engagement if he's freaking out, you know, and then you know, complaining about uh, bad processes. That's not what I mean, um, but I mean like more more the other layer, but I'm not sure what, what you meant. No, I mean, um, listen, I think, I think the point, um, I think there will be, if, if we kind of look at um, the perfect agent, currently it's an, it's an analog agent, and that person deals with the insurance for me, make sure that my data is up to date, make sure that if I have the child, I'm up to date, you know, kind of takes um, a, an index of my current situation and obviously continuously checks the market for the best coverage, right, the ideal Agent. Now I think that is an is is a good it's a tried and tested model that customers are willing to pay for, and I think to emulate that in a technical way is a very smart way and probably has a higher probability than trying to become um, the most sexy insurance plan, right? Um, I, I would say so. I would I would kind of say try to minimize active engagement, but passive engagement behind the scenes because. You can aggregate more, and this is, I would say, on the when people say engagement more in the underwriting renewals process. Now, I think insurers have been traditionally awesome um, in you know um, how to regulate certain claims, um, deal with replacements. Now, it doesn't always seem that because uh, we don't engage with it, but try to build up I don't know a car repair network, you know, from scratch as a startup. Be my guest. <laughs> It's really hard. Um, so I think there has been a lot done, but sometimes I feel it's, uh, ooh, let's look at what this great neobank does and all these push notifications and let's ping a um, health activity thing and then you get a little coupon and then a little, I, I think you, it's kind of playing a little bit um, and I would not go onto this more superficial type of engagement, but the passive engagement on the ground, um, in the background, I think is very good. If I may build on top of your very good comment, that's where we actually are combining this technology. For example, this agent you want to discuss, rather than trying to help people navigate when it comes to our uh, web pages or mobile what have these, uh, having that intelligent background on our uh, contact center, analyzing, okay, this is the uh, tone and content of the discussion, doing it the real time, and then guiding the person, our person, through with you enabling that you have the best knowledge we have combined in our company. Another example when it comes to doctors, we in fact bought one of those private doctor chains to enable this uh, fully automated. Yes, of course you did. 
That's the fun part. As an interest, we have funds, we can buy stuff. Yeah. I've noticed, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, it makes the other things harder. But coming back to the uh, doctor topic, uh, having then intelligence in place to guide you the uh, process where we take care of your problem, forget the claims, that's handled in the background. But really addressing the problems our uh, customers have when they engage with us. And that's where intelligence, whether it's mechanical or even physical, helps quite dearly. So, so, and that's of course where we're putting our investments to be there for our clients when, when it matters. So that's in short. And, and maybe this is also the, also the beauty of the industry. We now made fun about, you know, insurers are capable of buying something. But to be quite honest, uh, insurer could uh, buy out of their pocket change most insurtech uh, in, in, in Europe. And this is a good thing because if we go outside and look about uh, our friends from the finance and banking industry, there are a lot of big names not here. You know, not because they don't want or have anything better to do, but because they simply cannot afford it anymore. And they are like drowning while we are still sitting at the beach and thinking, you know, I'm not sure how big the tide is going to be. Um, so that's a fun thing about our industry. And we really can still, you know, do some mistakes and, and fight for the best solution for our companies, for the industry. So, so that's really, really cool. That's why I love it uh, also here, you know. Um, <laughs> nevertheless, but, but one point about the push notifications um, to, to engage with the customer. I agree, if it does not make sense and you disturb the person you should not do it but you know if I submit a claim and I don't hear anything for weeks sure. and on the other hand I'd fly with KLM and on my way from the you know plane through this you know thing where you walk through and you don't see anything I already get a push notification on which belt my um, uh, suitcase is and they know if I don't have a suitcase they don't send me one uh, that's great and um, if you do projects at insurers and you apply something similar like that, the amount of um, customer requ requests you get via the call center just implode, and that saves you a lot of money. And you know, saving money—that's the language insurers really, really love hearing. I think. But but we can agree that before you go all into AI, maybe just get a fresh desk license and start with the ticketing system. I think that's not a bad idea. Okay, just as a first step. But again, adding intelligence. Um, this is very, at least for me, difficult to understand. Cars nowadays, I mean, they have all the gadgets and gears that prevent stuff happening. And, and only the uh, stats from last year, guess where most of the accidents take place, at least in Finland? In traffic lots, where people are parking their cars. Come on, with those Teslas and devices, who could add some intelligent? Again, I had this business case for actually putting concierge parking in place for Christmas because it would be far more uh, cheaper for us to have those 10, 15 persons standing there two weeks parking people's cars than paying for that Tesla rear bump for 5,000 euros a piece. Only by, oh, okay, it was so dark, I didn't see it. And then you have all the flashlights and noise on your screen saying, stop, please, you're about to hit something. So, uh, yes, we can be very, very intelligent internally. But then again, understanding where we can make difference together with our partners. And I think there's quite many places for innovation still out there to really prevent stuff happening. But uh, in interesting phenomena when, when trying to figure out, okay, where should change take place for us to actually change the way we operate? And that's why we are very keen in looking uh, not only in the inside living company, but also outside and understanding what's going on in the marketplace. Anyone with good idea preventing those parking lot accidents? I'm, I'm free to discuss that right at this time. Um, I mean, it's not only about parking uh, lots, but I think the significance of reducing a few a few 5,000 uh, euro claims is, is that add, uh, that adds up. Um, and actually, there's an uh, Israeli uh, startup uh, that is actually from a mutual insurer spin-off that were uh, able to do um, due to an algorithm that checks the applicant.